Well, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to our church at home service this Sunday. Um, and uh, knowing that uh, a number of you, or certainly those of you who have uh, kids, uh, quite possibly school going kids, or maybe possibly in holiday mode already, uh, we're thankful that we can be here and that we can meet again online as the, uh, a number of folk gather in the church building. Uh, and we just want to thank the Lord for all of these opportunities and how He works. Now, if you uh, joined us last week, uh, you'll remember that we uh, kind of hit pause in our series in Acts to look and think about and see from God's Word as to how we uh, live in the light of that purpose as disciples of Jesus Christ that, that's reflected in Acts by the apostles and by that early church. Uh, and what we saw in that uh, was that we are all uh, full-time ministers as well as church members partners at Emmanuel Church, all alike, called to do works of ministry. And those can be in more kind of official uh, ways or formal ways, uh, as well as in a number of other ways. Uh, and so uh, it was a great opportunity to see the reality that we are all called into. Uh, and today we're going to be uh, kind of diving in just a little bit further uh, into that. Uh, Pastor Paul is going to be preaching from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and we're going to see uh, just this reality of a discipleship relationship what it looks like between Paul uh, and and his disciple Timothy that he's discipled and we walk this journey with and so we want to pray and ask the Lord to guide us in that just before we do that uh, we're also thankful for a, a number of opportunities a number of ministry opportunities that are opening up again and uh, as we saw last week, that we are all called to, to kind of get stuck in and get involved. We want to be encouraging you uh, to think about how you could serve uh, in any one of these areas. Uh, the list is endless as such. If I think of just the, the formal ministries here at Emmanuel, our community outreach, outreach ministries and Seeker, uh, Pizza Boss uh, through our monthly feeding uh, plan. Uh, Heatherbank School is getting going again now in the new term. Uh, we have a, a number of kids programs. Our, our kids church uh, is officially starting. While there are, is already a kids church program, program happening on Sunday mornings, uh, is officially starting again in the new term, our youth uh, on Friday evenings. Uh, and so if you would like to find out a little bit more about how you could get involved, uh, be it from welcoming folk in the services to uh, helping with the tea and coffee, which again should start in about a month's time or so, or or, or, or maybe there's other ways you're not even precisely sure that, that are there. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to get hold of me, get hold of Pastor Paul or Diane at the office, uh, and we'd love to plug you in or, or, or even just let you know a little bit more as to how you can get involved serving. Um, not just so that one can serve, but as we saw last week, that we can grow, that we can be discipled while we make disciples uh, and ultimately live for the glory of Jesus in that. And so uh, now as we come and as we prepare to hear from God's word in 2 Timothy, uh, will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you, Father, that we uh, can meet freely, uh, physically, uh, in one's presence, uh, as we meet uh, as a church in our church building, uh, and online here as well. We thank you that we can do this freely without fearing persecution. We thank you that we have your word with us uh, so often that we just take for granted uh, in Bibles uh, in front of us at home or, or on our phones and devices, so freely available, the, the word of the living eternal God. And so, Father, now as we hear from your word, we ask, Lord, that you speak to us, that you use it to grow us, to teach us more about what discipleship looks like and how we can understand it today as 21st century disciples of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, Lord, we ask that you continue to grow us in that understanding while we grow in our purpose of living for you. So I thank you, Father, for all our church. Thank you for those who are able to come to our physical services. I thank you for those who are able to engage uh, and join in through our church at home services, through, through uh, the audio uh, sermons which go out via WhatsApp, through those who connect even during the week. And Father, we pray and ask that you continue to grow us, even though some of us responsibly are distancing, continue to grow us together through the relationships that we have with one another, through Jesus, by Jesus, and for Jesus. Will you work by your Spirit? Will you enable us to give the glory to God as you have taught us? And will you speak to us now today? We pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. 
Good morning, Emmanuel. It's good to be with you. And uh, trust that um, as we come together as God's people to, to worship God, that your time spent uh, with God and His Word would be a great blessing to us this morning. Um, I'm going to begin by, by reading our passage this morning, uh, which comes from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'll read from verses 1 to 7. Uh, the uh, title of my sermon this morning is Shaped by the Grace of God. But let's read God's Word first. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will for the sake of the promise of life in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly loved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my ancestors did when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Louis and in your mother Eunice and now I am convinced is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound mind. This is indeed the word of the Lord. Well, like I said, it's great to be with you all this morning, and I uh, do pray that God, in His grace and mercy, would, would lead and guide us and encourage us this morning. And uh, once we uh, have fulfilled our mission here, uh, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, that you would be encouraged to go into this new week uh, aflame, uh, rekindled, as Paul says, ready to take on the world. Well, it's always a privilege to bring God's word to you. And we trust as we dig into the passage this morning, God by his spirit will teach and lead us into the wealth of knowledge and understanding so, so that we may live lives that is worthy of the calling of our God. Sunday pastor, uh, Pastor Andre, uh, laid out a challenge uh, of the need for ongoing conviction and, and growth and living out the Christian life. That within the confines of our local church, we all have a responsibility to bring others to Christ, grow them in Christ, in other words, to make disciples of all people, not just here in Port Elizabeth, but to the ends of the earth. I do believe the best possible way to begin that is for you to know that the responsibility will begin with us as leaders. Just as we need to hold you accountable, there is an expectation that you too will hold us accountable. So what I would like to do this morning is to see from the text what are some of the things that you need to see in us as leaders leading the flock. And if those things are lacking, then I need to know that you will be able to come to me and Andre directly and keep us accountable. Why? Because that is God's command to you and me. But before we go any further, let me pray and ask God's guidance as we look at his word this morning. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this enormous privilege we have to be found in the presence of a holy God. Lord, I do pray that now we will decrease as the Lord Jesus Christ increases in our life. Will you bless your word and the proclamation of your word this morning and help us, Lord, to go from here encouraged corrected, rebuked, and trained in righteousness, so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Well, Paul's words in 2 Timothy are not only deeply personal, but they are also deeply theological. And this letter to Timothy is saturated with gospel-centered content. John Stott, in his commentary, says this, Paul's preoccupation in writing to Timothy was with the gospel, uh, the deposit of truth 
which had been revealed and committed to him by God. And with this dominant uh, theme in mind, Stott outlines the book of 2 Timothy in this way. In chapter 1 he says, God the gospel. In chapter 2 he says, suffer for the gospel. In chapter 3 he says, continue in the gospel. In chapter 4 he says, proclaim the gospel. Now indeed this letter is both timely and timeless. Nothing can be more important for you and I today than to rightly guard and give the gospel to the next generation. It is often said that we are, the, we are one generation away from losing the gospel. And if the gospel is assumed in one generation, it will be neglected and ignored and abandoned in the next generation. So we must keep guarding it, Paul says. We must keep suffering for it. We must continue in it. And we must proclaim this gospel unrelentlessly. And to do that, friends, we need gospel-centered leaders. Now, in these initial verses, we are introduced to the key figures of the letter, and that is Paul and Timothy. And Paul begins by describing the origin and purpose of his apostleship. And then he describes some of the background of Timothy's life and ministry. And as we observe verses 1 to 7, we learn how God calls us according to his will and shapes us by his grace. We gain important insight as to how God builds a gospel-centered leader. But first of all, we need to see that Paul was called by the will of God. Paul says that he was an apostle of Christ Jesus in verse 1. By claiming this title, Paul placed himself in the same camp as the twelve who were called by Jesus or selected by Jesus as his apostles. And like this, Paul had the privilege of learning directly from Jesus. He was sent by the Master with unique apostolic authority to teach in Jesus' name. And of course, Paul's uh, apostleship was slightly different from the twelve because he was somewhat of a late addition to the twelve, obviously. And so on the road to Damascus, the risen Lord uh, arrested Paul and commissioned him with a particular call to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And even though Paul humbly called himself the least of the apostles, he was indeed part of this very select group of young people. Therefore, this letter comes to us with divine authority, friends, because it comes from a divinely inspired apostle. It is a letter not just for Timothy in the first century, but for Christians of all times in all places. May the Lord give you and I understanding in everything regarding this book of sacred scripture. Now Paul's apostleship was not owing to anything in and of himself. Uh, he states that his position was established by God's will. Uh, Paul did not volunteer for the position. Uh, he wasn't kind of summoned to it. Uh, it wasn't a career move of Paul, and we know that very clearly. If anything, Paul was the opposite of. The Bible says that Paul was appointed in verse 11. You see, how God shaped Paul as a gospel-centered leader wasn't simply just to, simp to call him and then leave him to his own devices, no. But he empowered Paul to put his best foot forward and to grow by the sweat of his brow. Now the apostle we know was a worker and he says as he writes that he worked more than any of them. But Paul's work was preceded by God's work of calling him first. And Paul's work was made possible by the enabling grace of God. Yet not I, but God's grace that was with me, he says in 1 Corinthians. Now God shaped Paul into a mighty leader by first calling him by grace and then empowering him with divine strength. Now while we are not apostles in the same sense as Paul and, and the twelve, we do share some common experiences with them as those who 
trust in Jesus Christ. And like Paul, God calls us to himself by his own will and pleasure. And by his power, he enables us to live faithfully before him for his glory. So what was the purpose of Paul's apostleship? Well, he said, you'll find that also in verse 1 of chapter 1. Paul said that his calling was according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Paul was commissioned to communicate the gospel, which he described as the promise of life. As Paul awaited death, he knew there was a promise of life for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the gospel gives life because at the heart of our message, friends, is that person, Jesus Christ, who himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John says, the one who has the Son has life. Paul also writes that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And indeed, this theme runs throughout the Bible, for in Genesis all through to, and later in Revelation, we read of people eating of the tree of life and drinking from the water of life. You see, the, the, the gospel is like water. Man did not invent it, and man cannot live without it. Therefore, brothers and sisters of Jesus, will you take this water to thirsty men and women? Are you showing the thirsty where you can find, where they can find this everlasting water? So we see that Paul wasn't simply some fly by night who was seeking his own agenda, but rather we see a man called by the author of life, Jesus, the Son of God, according to the will of God. So that's Paul. But let's now look at some of those things that shaped Timothy into the man Paul saw as a candidate for leadership. Now there were three shaping influences in Timothy's life. And like us, Timothy was still a work in progress. And Paul mentions three means of grace that God used to transform the servant a personal mentor, a godly mother, and the spirit and the gifts. Let's look at them a little bit more closely. First of all, personal mentorship. We see that in verses 2 to 4. Now it is possible that Timothy met Paul and embraced the gospel on Paul's initial visit to Lystra. We see that in Acts chapter 14. By the time Paul visited Lystra a second time, we know that the brothers there spoke highly of Timothy. Uh, they referred to Timothy's wonderful spiritual growth and his maturity. And then Paul took Timothy with him on his mission. And we see that in Acts chapter 16. And we see several snapshots of, of Timothy's ministry alongside Paul leading up to the writing of 2 Timothy. Now Paul, Paul viewed Timothy as his own spiritual child. He introduces Timothy in verse 2 as his dearly loved son. And he says many other wonderful things about this loyal disciple. He commends Timothy to the Philippians. Paul confesses, For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. You know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. What a wonderful commendation that is. Further, Paul extends a greeting to his son, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this triad, Paul highlights the indescribable love of God. God gives grace to the desperate. He gives mercy to the guilty and peace to the restless. And all of that he does through his son, Jesus Christ. In verse 3, Paul expresses his love for his disciple by, think, by thanking God for him. Paul mentioned that he thanked God like his ancestors did. See, Paul was not being disloyal uh, to his Jewish 
ancestors and his heritage by believing in Jesus. No, his faith was the fulfillment of their faith and their hope. When Jews come to Jesus, they're in a sense coming home. Now, not only does Paul thank God for Timothy, but he also intercedes on his behalf. I constantly remember in my prayers day and night. We know that Paul urged believers to pray constantly. We see that in 1 Thessalonians 5. That is to be in a continuous state of prayer. But perhaps he's referring here to periodic times of prayer. Some other references to Paul's prayer suggests that he set aside times for prayer, just, just like Jesus did. Should we pray without ceasing? Absolutely. Should we live in communion with God all the time? Absolutely. But we also see the need to set aside specific times because we know that we cannot find ourselves all the time. We, we as human beings are constantly distracted. But it helps to set aside specific times to go into your prayer closet and to pray and to have relationship with Jesus. It's both wise and beneficial for you and me to do that. And it's a great discipline to have irrespective of your circumstances. Now we see Paul was locked in a prison. But that didn't stop him from praying. No, his heart was free to seek the Lord in living prayer. You see, discipleship, my friends, is not a once-off thing. It is an ongoing thing. So Paul wasn't finished with Timothy. Even though he was under, uh, in prison under harsh circumstances and conditions, his work continued, praying for his disciple. And the privilege of having faithful saints praying for us, wow, that's a great thing. I'm always reminded, almost weekly I get messages from Cape Town from a friend, a dear friend, who says, Paul, today I prayed for you and Geraldine. Paul, today I prayed for your son. Paul, I prayed for your son-in-law. Paul, I prayed for your, grandpa your grandchildren. What a wonderful thing that is to know somebody's praying for you. Oh, the privilege of having faithful saints praying for us. Paul's thankfulness, his thoughtfulness and prayerfulness were driven by two Dynamic, dynamics. His peaceful condition that he was in before God and his personal love for Timothy. Now Paul's condition before God is noted with the phrase a clear conscience in verse 3. Paul was not sinless, but he was guiltless. What a wonderful thing. And that is because Jesus had taken Paul's guilt through his substitutionary death on the cross away as far as the east is from the west, to remember it no more. And God cleansed Paul's guilty heart from an evil conscience through the work on the cross. Paul experienced the, the wonderful blessing that every two, true believer shares, peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And the greatest thing, friends, as we approach our deaths, Paul shows that there is nothing greater than knowing that our sins are forgiven. Is there anything more important than having a clear conscience before you die? I'm mindful of the, of the hymn writer who penned these words. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's the song of one who possesses a clear conscience, my friend. Question this morning, is it well with your soul? The next thing, Paul's love for Timothy is particularly expressed beautifully in verse 4. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. It sounds like a, a love letter, isn't it? Evidently, the last time Paul and Timothy were together, there were tears. And maybe it was just before Paul was taken off to the Roman prison. But now he wanted to see Timothy, that he might be filled with joy, he says. And this is the picture of a faithful believer's confidence before death and a loving mentor's attitude towards his disciple. 
How important is life on life discipleship to you this morning? Not just pastors, but all of us can easily overlook the important task of mentoring people. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul instructs Timothy to invest in other men the way Paul invested in him. Do you have a Paul in your life? Do you have a Timothy in your life? Who is your spiritual son or your spiritual father? What exactly do you do in a mentoring relationship? Well, verses 3 to 4 shows us two essentials behind the act of mentoring. Love and prayer. A true mentor must start here. From this starting point, I see some lessons for us who desire to mentor others. Paul helped Timothy in three areas. Calling, his character, and his competency. In terms of calling, Paul encouraged Timothy to use the gifts God had given him to live out his calling. As for his character, Paul urged Timothy to pursue godliness, endurance, love, and other Christ-like qualities. As for ministerial competency, Paul coached Timothy on how he should respond to people appropriately. Oh, that's so big in our ministry, friends. How do you deal with people on a daily basis? Study the word diligently. Preach the word faithfully. And do the work of an evangelist constantly, he says. And if you are an older leader, invest in a Timothy. Help him fan the flame of his calling. Develop Christ-like character in him. And grow, help him to grow in his competency. So that's personal mentorship. But it wasn't just personal mentorship that's important. There was also godly parenting, or in this case, a godly mother. Timothy not only had the privilege of a mentor, but he also had the gift of a godly mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Louis. In verse 5, Paul mentions the faith of all three of these individuals. And he says, Timothy, like these ladies, has a sincere faith, is the genuine article. But Paul's statement, I'm convinced this faith is in you also, he says. We are reminded of how every child must do his or her own believing. Timothy had the blessing of having a Christian mother and grandmother, but he still had to believe for himself. He still had to take responsibility for his faith. While it seems that Timothy's father was an unbelieving Greek, these two ladies were vibrant Christians. Who knows? What we do know is that these godly ladies' faith was observable by Paul. Probably before they were believers, they taught Timothy the Old Testament. But now the understanding of the Scriptures was Christ-centered. Timothy and these godly mothers came to know and love the fact that the Scriptures make us wise for salvation because they point us to the Savior himself, who is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. Now, from a parental perspective, friends, having children is a wonderful gift from God. But with that gift comes huge responsibility. Are you teaching your kids the Scriptures? Are you spending time with them? Do your children see in their moms and dads sincere faith in Christ? One cannot overstate the importance of living out the Christian life before watching children. I want to say to my kids, follow my teaching, follow my conduct, follow my purpose, follow my faith, follow my patience, follow my love and endurance. A godly mother, godly parents is vitally important, friends. But finally, and I think most significantly, of the things that shape us as godly-centered leaders is that God shaped Timothy into the leader through the presence and the gifting of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
Paul says, therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you. As judged by the surrounding context of, of 1 and 2 Timothy, we, we, we note that <laughs> Timothy wasn't the spiritual rock, was he? Timothy appears to be physically weak, personally timid. He was a young man. But you see, God delights in using the weak and the ordinary in order to demonstrate what his mighty power. And thankfully, God uses clay jars like you and me, friends, so that he and only he can get the glory. You see, knowing the reality of God's power in the life of Timothy, Paul urges him to, to keep ablaze his gift. And what is this gift? Well, we don't know for certain, but it seems connected to the phrase, through the laying on of hands. And this phrase seems to refer to an ordination or a commissioning in which Paul affirmed uh, Timothy's, God's calling Timothy's life. If so, then this gift is probably related to the spiritual endowment necessary for the work of ministry. And Paul is reminding Timothy that God equips his servants to fulfill their ministry by granting them spiritual power and gifting. And how encouraging it is to remember that God is the one that gives his people the authority and enablement to carry out the assignments that he so gives them. Now, not everyone will have a personal mentor or a godly mother, but God himself does invest spiritual gifts in every believer. You see, the gifting of the Spirit not only encourages us and inspires worship, but it also inspires hard work. And Paul reminded Timothy of his personal responsibility in becoming a gospel-centered leader. He told him to develop and use his gifts to maintain spiritual discipline. And first we see that the gift is like a fire. The Greek, the Greek verb is in the present used here, the present, in the present tense, and it emphasizes ongoing action. You see, Paul was urging Timothy to keep the fire alive. Indeed, he wanted it to be ablaze and on, uh, you know, in, in fullness by making full use of the gift that God had given him. And he was to do this then by exercising his gift passionately. God gave Timothy gifts to be used and developed. Now there is no room for sluggishness in the Christian life. Rest, yes. But laziness and passiveness and timidity shouldn't characterize the believer. I'm so mindful of Jim Elliot who prayed this prayer and this is what it says. And it captures well the, the spirit of, of what Paul is talking about. He says, God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life and may I burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, are you using your gifts passionately? Don't be a Christian waiting on the sidelines, hoping someone will call you to do something in the church, whether it's preaching or leading or serving tea or, or being a steward. If God has gifted you, then use your gift. We often make excuses to justify our fear and trepidation in fulfilling ministry. Step up, I say. Trust the promises of God and give yourself wholly to the gospel. As Martin Lloyd Jones once said, go gossip the gospel. Go share it with one person in a coffee shop or in a park in your neighborhood. But yet, go overseas and gather up children under the, the trees in Africa. Go share the gospel with them. You see, we need to be developing and using our gifts for ministry. Paul says, fan it into flame. That's what he's telling Timothy. That requires work and effort and intentionality. The second thing Paul says to Timothy, to maintain discipline. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. 
Paul here addresses Timothy's shyness and weaknesses and reminds him that his fear did not come from God. But what comes from God is a spirit of power of love and discipline. Now, there is discussion of whether or not spirit should be translated as spirit with a capital S or a spirit with a lower case S. While Paul may have referred to the small spirit, that does not mean the Holy Spirit is not in view here. And the word for in verse 7 alludes back to verse 6, where the reference is to the big spirit, the Holy Spirit's gifting in Timothy. Additionally, the words love and power are used especially for the work of the Spirit elsewhere in Scripture. Boldness, not cowardness, is the mark of the Spirit's work in believers. And the object of Timothy's fear remains unclear. Perhaps it was evangelism or proclamation, whatever it was, pastoral leadership. We don't know. We know that this fear paralyzed Timothy, but it didn't have to. We notice that even Paul faced fear. When he planted the church in Corinth, the Lord appears to him in a vision and says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you. I have many in the city who are my people, he says. Do you see this? The Lord tells Paul to fight fear with his promises. He promises to be with him, to protect him, and to use him to bring people into the kingdom. And now Paul is directing Timothy to do, to, to, to have the same source of hope. He says essentially, Timothy, in your fear, remember that God is with you, in you and for you. It's his spirit that produces the power you need to endure and the love you need to, to minister. Be disciplined, my boy. Be diligent, he says. Be brave, for God is with you. Now, we all experience uh, fear and timidity in some way, isn't it? But the Spirit of God empowering the people of God is sufficient to accomplish the mission of God. Therefore, there is no excuse for not performing our mission with diligence. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. The Spirit and the gifts, friends, are ours. God has given us the spiritual gifts to execute our ministries and, and the spiritual power to enable our ministries. How then is a, a gospel-centered leader formed? Well, from this passage we see the mysterious combination of, of God's provision and man's humble responsibility. For Paul, clearly God appointed him and enabled him. But his appointment did not mean Paul was to be passive. No, he was to proclaim the promise of life actively. In the life of Timothy, God provided a mentor. God provided godly parents or godly mother and grandmother. But most of all, God provided his spirit and the gifts to make him into an instrument for noble purposes. But Timothy had the responsibility of using these gifts. What about you? Do you recognize the gifts God has given you? Are you resting on his promises? Are you relying on his power? And are you serving him with passion? Well, I encourage you to come with us and serve with us here at Emmanuel. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gifts that you've given us, and most importantly, the gift of life through your son, Jesus. But Lord, as your people, help us to be obedient. Help us to be willing partners of the gospel. Help us to give of ourselves fully for the work of the gospel. Why? That you, O oh God, may be glorified. We commit ourselves to you and thank you again for the great privilege which is ours to serve you in this way. We thank and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, thank you, Paul, uh, for that great uh, sermon today. And, and what an encouragement it is when we see this kind of sincerity, this kind of relationship. Uh, and that's the relationship that the Lord has brought us into, ultimately with Him, but that He also calls us to live out uh, with one another.
Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, if you are uh, celebrating or, or having uh, some time off, uh, some holiday time with your family, uh, we hope that you are enjoying your time away if you'd be able to get away. Uh, maybe it's just another week for you. Well, it's our prayer that you go into the week uh, knowing that Christ is with you, that he is for you, uh, and that he is working through you. Uh, just last little uh, bit of info to leave you with today. Uh, our golf day, our golf day, which is there to raise funds for our men's and women's ministry. We're looking forward to two planned, uh, one women's retreat next year, uh, one men's camp. We, we wanting to use this to raise funds uh, to bring along as many uh, of our church family as possible. Uh, and so we're still looking for folk to get stuck in, uh, into the golf day, to sign up, to play, as well as to serve. Uh, at the time as well so if you'd like to find out more please do contact the church office get hold of bianca who's heading up the golf day uh, and find out how you can get involved uh, let's close uh, just with this a uh, little bit from paul uh, as he wrote to the ephesians in ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church and in christ jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a great Sunday further.